Hello, welcome back. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm going to give a Dharma talk. Uh, so I can start now because it's time. Yes. Today, I'm going to talk about turning difficult emotions into opportunities for awakening. Emotions are very common in our life. I'm going to give specific references to difficult emotions, greed, fear, anger, anxiety, all kinds of emotions, but also these awesome emotions, loving kindness, compassion, happiness, joy. But my topic is going to focus more difficult emotions like anger. So if you, you have anger or planning to have anger, this talk is good for you. So uh, basically, uh, emotions, uh, they cover a big chunk of our life. And they shouldn't be confused with uh, what we call feelings. Feelings are very organized. Pleasant feelings, unpleasant feelings, neutral feelings. Emotions are so disorganized. One moment you have fear, another moment you have anger, another moment you have anxiety. So they're very disorganized and short, in the short moments, you are going to go into a roller coaster of emotions. You're going to be hijacked, with difficult emotions. But the good news is that uh, according to Buddha's teaching, we can actually do something about it. We can understand them, we can use wisdom, can use, you can use so many, methods to turn them into awakening. I remember when I was in West Virginia for eight years, they had a lot of snow in winter, and the, this snow blocked our path to the place where we used to stay. We used to call them cotis, small houses where monks stay. So the snow would like, be so much and it made it difficult for us to walk through the snow. And in those stoves, uh, those cooties had stoves and uh, wooden stoves. We had to use wisdom stove to, uh, to keep the fire going to warm, to warm ourselves at night. So they would, uh, these stoves would get so hot at night because outside is a lot of snow. So what we did is to put some water to counteract the emotion and the, what you call, uh, humidity, humidity. We would use uh, water and put a certain saucepan on top, put water inside, and then it would balance out the heat at night. So we would then carry water and put it in a saucepan. And that kind of water was very burdensome. Very heavy to carry water in the jerry can and put it near Kuti. You have to shovel snow to go uh, through the path. So for me, one time I say it doesn't make sense to carry water. Why don't I use the snow on my path and shovel it into the saucepan and it melts into water? So in other words, I use the snow, which was obstacle. Uh, on a path, and it turned into water, which actually uh, would melt, and then uh, at night uh, it would balance out the humidity. I said, yes, I have a lot of uh, emotions. I can use them to uh, basically recycle them and then get something good out of it. And in this case, something good about it would be wisdom and understanding. So that's what I call opportunities for awakening. So uh, when I was growing up uh, in Uganda, I, I had the strong allergies with the uh, red meat. 
and I would I would get a version every time I would uh, eat meat, and uh, I didn't like it because of my strong allergies, and I didn't really like it. <laughs> so I had a lot of aversion towards meat. So uh, later on, I found out it's not about eating meat, tasting meat. It was about the whole range of relating to it, like thinking about eating meat, uh, seeing it, touching it, smelling it. I remember during Christmas time in Uganda, they used to roast this meat. And, and the smell, I mean, the, whenever I smell uh, this smoke, I would get stomach problem. So I would suffer almost six times thinking about it with all the senses, six senses. I would suffer <laughs> hearing it, hearing that somebody is going to give me meat, I will really get a aversion towards it. But when I started meditating, actually, I started really be mindful of my six senses as when I, I see the meal, uh, red meat, I would actually start to be mindful of my six senses. And that, that hit me a lot. I still don't eat red meat, but I don't have a lot of aversion towards it. <laughs> so now with the emotions like anger, I found out it's the same thing. When anger rises, you can use Buddha's teaching uh, on the discourse called the foundation of mindfulness. Buddha talked about 21 ways of mindfulness. And uh, we are going through some of them and see how they can help us to turn these obstacles, and difficult emotions to, into opportunities for awakening. So now one of them is called mindfulness of the six senses. In other words, restraining your senses. So when anger arises, uh, actually even before it arises, that's why this method is very important. Before anger arises, every time when you live our life, um, we should live our life being mindful of the six senses, seeing, hearing. That's so when somebody says something, you just become aware of hearing. And in Uganda, it happens. Uh, it happened a lot when I just come to Uganda in 2005 as a monk. Uh, actually, most of the people were talking, oh, this is a, a Shaolin master. This is a... Uh, this person is crazy, you know, in the robes. He's going to a mental hospital. Or he's going back, for, uh, he's coming from a mental hospital. I'll just become aware of hearing, hearing, hearing. So I stop any reaction or so uh, by saying, oh, this person, why is he talking about bad things about me? I'll just uh, become aware of hearing, hearing, hearing. So that really prevented me from anger rising in the present moment. So in other words, this really uh, can help you to really uh, prevent a difficult emotion from happening. But of course, sometimes they happen. Yeah, they happen. It's just like actually when you you put your, you construct your house, you put ventilators. Ventilators can help you to get in oxygen uh, of course, uh, but also prevent rubbish to come. Uh, but sometimes still uh, rubbish can come. Let's say in a window, you put some window screen, still dust can come in. Air can come in, but dust also can come in. Though you prevent the uh, leaves and the rubbish to come, and still there are certain things that comes in in your ventilator or window seals. So now there's another method that we can use, again, from the foundation of mindfulness. Uh, we have seen mindfulness of successes. The next one is mindfulness of the presence and absence of the emotion itself, let's say anger. So when anger arises, just become aware of anger. Make it into the ob meditation object. Anger, anger, anger. Angers are rising. So there's no need to use words. Just pay attention to the presence of the emotion. But also it's very interesting to pay attention to 
the absence of the motion as the sutta goes, the discourse goes like this, that we should also uh, try to pay attention to the absence of that particular emotion. It is a fear, but I'm focusing more on, on anger here. So when anger is absent, you look at what's the, uh, what's the absence of that anger. Maybe it's loving kindness, maybe it's compassion. So this is very, very important when we pay attention to the absence of anger, because there are certain mind states that arises from that mindfulness of the absence of the emotion. We begin to experience gladness. Wow, anger has subsided, aversion has subsided. So there arises gladness as a mind state. From gladness, joy will arise. As the Buddha say, from joy, calmness is going to arise. From calmness, happiness. Uh, from happiness, uh, even if you can gain concentration if you really pay attention to the absence of these mind states. So or another set of mind states arises naturally. Gladness, joy, and so on. So that's really uh, the second way of turning difficult emotions to uh, opportunities for awakening. Now, another way which is also very, very helpful is to look at what's my attitude that um, uh, whenever there's a, a, a mind state, whenever there's an emotion like anger, what's my attitude? Is it a proper attitude or is it a wrong attitude? Sometimes we may adapt a very wrong attitude when we have such a difficult emotions. They say, try to push it away. We try to push it away. Oh, I don't want to be angry. Oh, we may indulge in it. I want to be more angry. <laughs> uh, I want to scream <laughs> on top of my voice. So you indulge in anger. Sometimes we might push it away. Sometimes we might ignore it. And sometimes we may have fear. We are afraid of being angry. So these are improper attitudes. So the proper attitude is to really use wisdom and understanding when these emotions are rising, to use courage to face it. And that's a proper attitude, to let go instead of indulging. Um, another attitude which is also very good is to really, uh, instead of trying to push it away, is try to uh, find out uh, can I be with it for a moment and see uh, how it feels uh, in the body, how it feels in the mind? So really uh, having a proper attitude is very, very important in, in the presence of these mind states. So another thing that I found out uh, we, that is very helpful is to look at uh, what the Buddha is talking about, insights, insights. What are the insights into these difficult emotions? This takes two uh, areas. One is insight into the conditionality of the emotion. Another one as an insight into the universal nature of this emotion. Like a condition, conditionality of, uh, of let's say an emotion like anger, we would look then, uh, again, the, uh, following the discourse, we look at the conditions for the rising of anger. What are the conditions for the rising of anger? Uh, according to Buddha, he, he, one of the conditions is to pay paying anyone's attention to the theme of irritation. Whenever there is irritation in our life, in our experience, then anger is going to arise naturally because of those conditions that are present. And uh, we look also at other conditions for the removal. If we, uh, let's say we want anger to go or a particular emotion to go, in this case, let's talk about anger. What are the conditions for its removal? Again, it's paying wise attention to the theme of loving kindness. May all beings be well about this. 
May all beings be free from suffering and its causes. So we pay, we pay wise attention. And uh, of course, according to the discourse, we look at also the paying wise attention to the non arising in the future. This can, you can only overcome this emotional anger is when you attain the, the, the third level of enlightenment. Second level, you may attenuate it, you may reduce it, but really to get rid of completely uh, this emotion of anger is when you attain the third level of enlightenment. So really it's good to look at the conditionality. Yes, insight into the conditionality of a particular emotion. Uh, then in terms of uh, insight into the universal nature of this emotion, uh, let's say, for instance, anger, we look at insight into impermanence, how it's changing all the time, the changing nature of a particular emotion. It's rising, passing away. Actually, most people, we say that we've been angry for the whole day. No, 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 no. Actually, anger is arising from moment to moment. It's not that one that you are angry for the whole week, the whole day. No, no. <laughs> it has a nature to arise and pass away, though we don't pay attention to that. Uh, let's say you get angry and then you go for a meal. You can't say you are taking a meal when you're angry. You are enjoying it. <laughs> enjoying the meal. At that moment, you might have breaks, you know, from the emotion, you know. So, but most of the time, we hang on to memories of being angry. And it's just a memory, you know. You're angry. Uh, you just remember that you're angry and then uh, that fuels in or feeds into the anger, you know. So really, we have to look at its impermanence nature that is rising and passing away all the time. And also we have to look at the, its universal nature of suffering, stress. Whenever we have, we have anger, we go under stress. In fact, the, the level of stress we go in under, one time I tested it by getting a book, to, to decide to read a book when you're angry, I was just reading one line, same line again, again another line. I could not go past uh, one line so because uh, I, I was under stress, you know. So we really look at the uh, suffering nature of this emotion, and that can help us to regain insight into the universal nature of the emotion. Again. Then also we look at, uh, uh, Actually, what I mean is being angry, not hungry. Yeah, so it's not hungry, but the memories of being angry, not hungry. <laughs> so uh, when we look at uh, uh, another universal nature of, of anger is selfless nature, impersonal nature of this anger. We find out anger, anger comes due to causes and condition. So we can see that, okay, this is not something personal. We can take it impersonal. Uh, instead of taking it personally, you can take it as impersonal. It has this impersonal nature because of causes and condition we have seen. So this is another way to look at uh, these difficult emotions, like uh, aversion, and then see how it's conditioned and it's in universal nature, impermanence and satisfactoriness or suffering or uh, in personal nature. So another way then to look at uh, way, uh, how we can turn them, this difficult emotion into opportunities for awakening is according to the discourse is not to depend on them. Hmm? Okay to live independently <laughs> and not cling on to them. So that's non-dependence, non-dependence, non-clinging. We don't cling on to this difficult emotion by way of I, mine, myself. Because I is conceit and the mind is craving. And just thinking that emotions are myself is what the Buddha talk about wrong views. So I am S. I, looking at emotions as I, mine, 
for him, serve myself. That's not the way to go. We should do or we should practice in a way that we see this difficult emotion by not depending on to them and also not clinging on to them as not I, not mine, not myself. There's a, uh, there is a, uh, a, a meditation center called IMS, Inside Meditation Society. So this is a way to remember, <laughs> not I, not mine, not myself. In other words, not IMS, not IMS. Because when you are thinking that emotion that I, mine, myself, you get into trouble of craving for the particular emotions, conceit that you're a very angry person and you get conceited, and also having uh, really uh, wrong views. So that's about five ways of dealing with emotions uh, using mindfulness. And uh, really, I'm going to give you more ways of dealing with emotions. Uh, let me see. Yes, we still have time. So uh, by way of recap, I will talk about uh, controlling your senses. And uh, then uh, uh, that's the first way, uh, six senses we need to control them. And also mindfulness of the presence and absence of a particular emotion. Uh, adapting a proper attitudes, uh, instead of pushing them away and indulging them, ignoring you know, them, you actually develop a proper attitude of understanding them so that you can dis dissolve them. Then uh, you, you also had talked about uh, non uh, developing insight into what you call conditionality and the universal nature of the emotion. That's also very helpful to gain insights. And then non-dependence, non-dependence, non-clinging non to this difficult emotion. Those are five ways that we can really use mindfulness in a discourse uh, given as the foundation of mindfulness. I'm going to use another discourse uh, to look at difficult emotions and uh, how we can turn them into opportunities for wisdom and awakening. It's, this discourse is called Vitaka Satana Sutta in Majima Nikaya, or the discourse on dealing with uh, destructive thoughts. Uh, it's a very, very meaningful, wonderful discourse, whereby the Buddha recommends, again with mindfulness, recommends a few tools that you can use to deal with difficult emotions. The first one, uh, it would be like replacing or substituting the emotion with the opposite. <laughs> Sorry. So we call that replacement method. When we have a difficult emotion, can we replace it with the, its opposite? So the opposite of less an emotion like anger we can re replace it with loving kindness and compassion. Emotions like fear, you can replace them with, uh, with courage. Emotions like uh, uh, attachment, greed, we can replace it with uh, letting go, with uh, generosity. So this is pretty clear, you know, very straightforward. You replace the emotion with, uh, it's opposite. Then uh, another method that we find, which is useful also, when that one doesn't work, replacement doesn't work, we can reflect. We can reflect on a particular emotion, let's say anger. Does it lead to happiness for myself, others, and all? You reflect. Or does it lead to suffering or stress? For myself, others, and both. So, really, once you really look at the emotion, this anger in that direction, and by reflecting on it, then you may be able to reduce it. You may be able to reduce the emotion. It's just like driving. When you are driving a car, and all of a sudden uh, you see a policeman, a uh, police person, or 
just uh, on the road, uh, traffic police, uh, and they give it, uh, you know that they're going to give you a ticket. Uh, in, I don't know about the tickets in the United States, but they're very expensive, I'm sure. So that kind of reflection can really help you to reduce your, your speed and not increase. So when you are on emotional roller coaster, so by reflecting that you're going to get a ticket, and which ticket do you get normally when you are in an in emotional roller coaster? You get a ticket of uh, stress. You get a ticket, very, very expensive ticket of suffering. You know, we suffer a lot. Actually, we know. Uh, actually, ang emotions like anger can lead to a lot of health problems. You know, yeah. So. When we reflect like this, actually, we can reduce uh, these uh, emotions. We can reduce it. Mm -hmm. We can reduce slowly by slowly. Just as you reduce your speed when you see traffic police, <laughs> you reduce the speed, you know, so that you don't get a ticket. <laughs> we do it all the time when we're driving. <laughs> we reflect, oh, I'm getting into danger. Let me drive slowly, you know. So we can also reduce the speed of our emotion mm -hmm. instead of... Uh, being caught up in high speed, and you slow down. You slow down slowly but slowly. So reflection is very important. In fact, uh, we can use, there's another discourse talking about reflecting along these lines, the danger of the defilement or the emotion, the degradation of the defilement, and also the defilement. So we reflect along those lines, the danger, defilement, and degradation of the emotion. So danger is the, <laughs> his oneness, the Dharma talked about anger is one less uh, letter mm, of danger. You know, we put D before anger, you get danger. That reminds you that you, you're in a danger zone, you know? <laughs> yeah, defilement is actually reflecting on defilement of the particular emotion is remembering that whenever you have a difficult emotion, And you give in a way, you give, you, you, you give in, you know, you indulge in the, that particular emotion. The more it becomes next time stronger. Next time is going to be stronger and stronger and stronger because of uh, indulging in a, a particular emotion. So if you, you are 10% today angry and you, be, you don't pay attention to it, <laughs> you don't replace it with the opposite, you don't become man from it. Next time, maybe it's going to become uh, 20%, 30%, 40%, 100%. So really, the amount of anger we have is something that uh, we've been building on, you know, <laughs> building on, building again and again. You know? So we need to pay attention I, uh, to these areas. I call it 3D, three dimension, mm -hmm. danger, deformment, and de degradation. Degradation is... Uh, Whenever you have to reflect on how anger degrades our, our status. When we become angry, people don't want to associate with us. They take us in a low grade status. Oh, this person is all, always losing it all the time. You know? I better avoid them. So now we go to another uh, interesting area also. And the third technique here, Buddha gave the third method, is called uh, redirection. Uh, we would call it redirection. You redirect your attention uh, from what's unwholesome, what's difficult, what, to something wholesome. Let's say when you have anger is coming, anger is ra ra raging, raging, and then you can now turn your mind to like the breath, which is wholesome. You can turn your mind to maybe the being mindfulness of the body. You turn to something that's really Awesome. Then the uh, fourth one is more of going to the root cause. What's you retrace, you go back. What's the uh, springboard of this emotion? And then once you go to the springboard, then it's much better. You can work with it. There's a for instance, fear. What's the springboard of fear? Maybe it's aversion. What's the root of aversion? Is uh, craving. Craving. And what's the the root of craving is ignorance. And what's the root of ignorance is otherwise attention. So we try to pay attention to the root cause. Uh, actually, uh, while uh, reflection was forward looking, uh, retracing is more backward looking. Look at what's 
uh, the spring month. And lastly, is resolve, making a strong resolve. Uh, whenever anger arises or difficult emotion, make a resolution, not to be the master, uh, not anger to be the master, but, but maybe uh, you want to be the master, your mind to be the master, and not anger uh, really taking you wherever it wants, uh, hijacking you wherever it wants. So my friends, uh, we have covered about 10 ways of dealing with the uh, difficult emotions and turning them from, uh, uh, from uh, turning these obstacles into opportunities for awakening and wisdom. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, this is what I can share from Uganda here in East Africa. And uh, I offer this for your reflection and I open it to question and answer session. Thank you very much. May you be well upon this issue. May you be able to turn difficult emotion into opportunities for awakening. Thank you. Uh, Bonte, do you want to take questions at this point? Yes, I would like to take okay. questions at this point. Okay, we're going to do it a little bit differently uh, tonight. Normally, uh, people are asked to raise hands, uh, but if you would please put your questions into the chat room, and I'll read them back to Bonte. Um, so if anybody has... Uh, oh, um, at 7.15, Kathleen has a question. Please repeat the three Ds. Yes, yeah, three dimensions. <laughs> we, we look at three dimensions, danger. The anger's dangerous. <laughs> so the, the Dharma has talked about, uh, the Dharma talked about uh, anger is less one letter of which is D, danger. So we look at the stress that we go through when we, we get these difficult emotions. Stress, distress, suffering, danger. We call that danger because it's, it's not good for your health. Psychologically, physiologically, emotionally. So this is very dangerous for you. So that's called danger. That's we find in the Upali Sutta. Uh, in Majmani time. Then, uh, then uh, many discourses we look, uh, the Buddha talks about reflection of the danger. And now defilement, another distance for defilement. That means when anger rises, it defiles your mind. So that next time it you even be more angry. Whether it's greed, you, today if you're, you're greedy for ice cream and you eat it and uh, out of greed, you can eat it out of, not so much out of greed, but if you have a lot of greed, so next time you are going to demand more ice cream, <laughs> more ice cream and more uh, uh, desire to buy ice cream. So is fear. If we have fear of something small like this, and then next time fear has got to be long. So it keeps on defiling your mind. It's just like a, a cloth. Uh, when you put in the soil, and now uh, again, you don't take care of it, and next time you keep on... Uh, walking with your cloth, uh, sweeping the dust. By the time you reach your destination, it will be more dusty because you didn't take care of it at the very beginning. <laughs> so it's a more defiled, defining the man again and again. So another D stands for uh, degradation, degradation. It degrades your, your status. Degradation, it means that, uh, that your friends uh, will take you in lower status. Every time they're going to say, well, uh, so degradation. Yeah, de de it degrades your status in that people who uh, takes you in a higher esteem uh, because you're calm and peaceful, once you start getting angry, uh, they will say, well, this person uh, cannot even, <laughs> Uh, really uh, deal with their anger or your anger, something like that. And if you become, a, as a Dharma teacher, it becomes very difficult, very, very difficult. They say, oh, this teacher is the one who even give a talk about dealing with difficult emotions. And now he's the one who's getting, uh, who's out of control, you know. So people start really reducing the way they, uh, they look at you. So those are called the three Ds, three dimensions of reflection. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for, for that. Thank you for the clarification.
That was really helpful. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Bonte, we had another question by Elizabeth um, at 717. Do you, can you recommend any resources uh, regarding the discourses you mentioned earlier? Yes, I'm going to say, uh, Maji Manikaya, uh, all the discourses that I've got right here, uh, you should refer to them. Uh, I'm going to just write the number, Maji Manikaya 19, uh, 20, 20, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, 19, 19, 19, 20. And uh, for, for this one, a month means, uh, uh, that's 10, management 10, 10. Okay. That's for status. Majimanikaya. So Majima, Majima, Majima Nikaya, Nikaya, Nikaya. Uh, 10 and 19, uh, 20. That's it. That's for starters. Great. Yeah. My tea, all my presentation today, it came from those three discourses combined. And that's where we can even deconstruct rain from there. Bonte, okay. another question comes from Ruby at 718. Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. asks, she's facing a painful cancer treatment and having a mm -hmm. really hard time working with fear. Do you have any specific practices for fear of continuing physical pain? Uh, really, uh, the thing is that, uh, uh, again, it's the same thing, working with the pain and fear. We use the same techniques uh, and methods. Uh, like, for instance, what's the What's the opposite of fear? The opposite of fear is courage. So you substitute it with courage. Let me have a courage to live this day. Let me uh, uh, replacing with uh, uh, aversion. It is uh, uh, also you, you can have loving kindness and compassion. In this case, you must have compassion toward yourself when it comes to replacement. Compassion, uh, replacing uh, because uh, there's a lot of aversion towards the pain, you can replace it with a uh, compassion, having compassion to yourself, because you are suffering, having compassion to yourself, and uh, all this kind of thing. Again, uh, as far as dealing with pain, uh, uh, as far as dealing with pain, uh, it's the same methods. Uh, when pain comes, uh, the, as far as pain, because there's a physical pain, there's more to that uh, that I didn't talk about, but it's the same principles, mindfulness of the presence of pain and its absence. Sometimes there's absence of pain, be mindful of it, but when it's present, you need to break it into elements. When there's a physical pain, you have to develop, break it into four elements, earth element, fire element, water element, and air element. So by breaking this physical pain into different elements, I'm getting, I'm using the method of mindfulness of the presence of pain. So you break it into different parts, you know, different parts. So what I'm feeling, whether I go through chemo, radiation, there'll be some kind of thing related to four elements, whether it's pressure, whether it's hot, hotness, uh, uh, the, whatever the pain, you need to break it apart. Because if we see pain as a, a solid thing, then it becomes more painful. But when we break it apart, then we are just seeing different strands, different strands that make what you call pain. pain. So mm -hmm. this being mapped on the brain, but you can break it apart. So to lose that concept of pain, and just like when you break something apart, there's a clock and you break into different parts, then you are not seeing it as a clock. You are just seeing different parts of the clock and uh, uh, different uh, small, small uh, objects. So that helps a lot with dealing with the physical pain. And of course, you look at uh, uh, not pushing it because most of the time is your reaction to pain that makes it more painful. Can we just uh, mm -hmm. respond it with wisdom and understanding? So then we try to say, okay, I have a lot of pain. Is there some nuggets of wisdom that I can get out of this? So it's the same principles, actually. 
but in a more detailed explanation, uh, if I'm invited one time to give a talk on how to deal with pain, and uh, and uh, the and this uh, and uh, pain and fear, then I can talk more. But it's the same principles. I've given ten ways of doing it. Same principle. Make a resolution. The same principles. Retracing all this kind of thing. Thank you very much for your question. But uh, for future, uh, I think for good starters, for for starters, just. Uh, resolve or break your pain into different parts and be mindful of just that strength. Where if it's pressure, just be aware of pressure. If it's hotness, be aware of hotness. If it's stabbing pain, if it's stinging, it's just, once you do that, then it's workable other than just observe one big ghost into your experience. Okay, thank you very much for that question. Good. Uh, Bonte, um... Question comes in at 719 uh, from Armand. Uh, it's a little challenging. Uh, do you think Christianity and or Islam have brought any peace or less bad emotions? Well, the thing that is a mixture. <laughs> I can't say I was born as a Christian, Roman Catholic. And uh, yes, and uh, there is some pain like any other thing. And there is some also peace. So it's a mixture. That's what my, I would say. I wouldn't say that 100% is pain because of the shant and Islam. Uh, and I got that teaching one time. I went to Japan. I, I saw a clock that died, uh, died uh, in 1945. So it has been dead <laughs> out of order since 1945. But when I was there, it was say, showing correct time. At exactly when it stopped, I was there. So it was showing correct time twice a day, <laughs> even a dead clock like that. So I wouldn't say that 100% uh, these things are broad suffering, 100%. Uh, In other words, uh, I, would, I would not say absolute, that absolutely this has brought 100% suffering or it has brought 100% uh, peace. I would say it has contributed some parts of peace and sometimes it has contributed to pain. So it's a balance. It's not something mm -hmm. one, one thing. Okay, another question. Yeah, Tom asks at 723, how does Buddhist practice differ in Africa versus the United States? Well, my friend, I've lived in USA also, and I've taught in USA, even up now I teach at the Union Historical Seminary in New York. And uh, I teach in uh, IMS, I teach in, uh, at Spirit Rock, I mean, most of the time, actually, I teach six months in the, uh, sorry, sorry, six weeks, sometimes three months. Of, uh, this is a longer retreat uh, at IMS in Barry, Massachusetts. And in Africa, I'm doing a research on healing intergeneration trauma, the intersection of uh, right mindfulness and African wisdom. So it's my PhD research, really. So I really observed the way how uh, we are slightly different uh, from uh, our counterparts in the United States. I think the Buddhism or mindfulness practices in the USA, it has a psychological bent, a psychological bent. It has a philosophy in it because people, and they have intellectuals, people have, uh, a bit uh, sophisticated in the uh, world thinking and critical mind and all. It, uh, in the in West, in, uh, I would say not only in America, because I teach in Australia, I've been teaching in Sweden, in UK. Uh, in the West, I've taught very well. So I see the Buddhism, uh, the way people understand Buddhism has a flavor of intellectual, of philosophy, uh, psychology, and all this kind of thing. So people can understand Buddhism in, in that lens. Uh, but in, that's in general, generalization. But in Africa, in general, we have a different way of understanding Buddhism. And I call it, uh, myself, I teach Buddhism in, 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 in Africa with, with an African flavor, uh, <laughs> an African flavor. In other words, chocolate flavor. <laughs> so now what I see here in Africa, we need the cultural context more of a cultural context in order to understand 
uh, mindfulness in order to understand Buddhism, it has to be uh, uh, come with traditional culture sensitivity to really see the connection. Well, you people in the United States, you connected with medicine, uh, yeah, with the psychology and all that. Uh, and that's uh, Western discourse, I think, uh, Greek philosophers and all that. So what, I'm not, not to say that we didn't have philosophers uh, or we don't have philosophers in Africa. We do have. Them. But for us, what we need in, uh, uh, to understand about Buddhism and mindfulness is actually more of a cultural context. Where does it fit in in our African thoughts, in our African culture? And I think I found out based on my research recently, uh, people can take Buddhism, uh, can Buddhism can, can understand better when it's laid out in a, a cultural context. That's the difference. The difference is very simple. Buddhism with an African flavor. Thank you very much. It's that different from uh, <laughs> Buddhism <laughs> or mindfulness in, in the West or in America. Thank you very much. Uh, Bhante, do you have time for one more question here? Oh, I have time. Okay. I have a lot of time. Okay. And actually, this, personally, that's my best. That's my best session, actually. Okay. Q and A, yeah. My Q and A is my best session okay. in everything. Okay. Yeah. Discussion well, Q and A is better than my uh, talk because in my talk. Uh, I kind of entertain myself, <laughs> but here, <laughs> yeah. So I entertain myself because I've been teaching emotions and uh, Buddhist counseling courses at the, at my university in, in Sri Lanka, and uh, I just enjoy the topic. Actually, but with the Q and A, you really think now when you ask me a question, ah, it makes me think. <laughs> And uh, I, I love it. It, it. it stimulates my thinking. So I'm, I have time. Okay. So Elizabeth at 7:30 asks, uh, similar to what you've been talking about, but uh, slightly different. Do you find African culture is less individualistic and easier to understand Buddhism better? Uh, well, that definitely, definitely. Uh, thank you very much for actually asking this question because. What I found out uh, that in, in Africa is that I have to teach mindfulness uh, not so much from an individual part of uh, individualism, but in what to call communal. So it has to be communal, communal teachings eh? in the context of community. So in other words, teaching Buddhism in the context of individual uh, alone is not going to help us. So we need to put it in the context communal context. So since we are more uh, communal societies, uh, not so much individualistic society, so all the teaching that I'm teaching here is really uh, bringing uh, others. How can we do it together, suffering together? How can we heal together? Because I saw it one time when somebody go, uh, lost, uh, a friend of mine passed away, uh, passed on, and then when I went to there to visit the, the, the home of my friend, I found all the people who used to work with my friend, uh, they were just holding together themselves. Like there were three girls holding them together and were crying. That means they were suffering together. It was just, just somebody just in the corner there really crying. It was just holding them together like this. For me, it was just a wonderful image when people are suffering together. So even the healing has to be together. Even the practice has to be together. Yes, you're right. You're right on, definitely. It's community. Uh, and uh, the mindfulness, then we look at the way how the Buddha taught, uh, internally, uh, externally, and both. Within oneself, others, and both. So for me, I shift so much mindfulness. You know, of course, I, see, I teach also mindfulness internally, individually. But I really zero in in practice mindfulness uh, externally and both internally and externally. In other words, uh, looking at oneself, looking at others uh, around you uh, in a meditation hall, in a, in a village and others. So all those teaching of compassion, gratitude and all that, it has to be communal, not so much individual like that. 
So that, thank you very much for asking that question. Yeah. I hope I intimate to get it. So uh, those are the questions that have been asked so far, uh, Bonte. Um, mm. um, unless somebody wants to put something in the chat box really quickly, lots of appreciation and thanks to you for, for this evening's talk. Um, right. Uh, oh, and thank you for getting up uh, uh, so early in the morning, someone says. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure sharing the Dhamma with you. And uh, uh, so I just go in for my meditation, uh, what's called morning meditation from here, because that's normally the time I go for meditation. <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> it works out very well to share with you. And uh, I'm so happy. My, my uh, dear friend, uh, Rick, that uh, actually I read his book. Actually, the, the way I read his book is when I was teaching uh, in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, Starling, uh, near Dallas Airport. I was teaching on how to deal with difficult emotions. And the lady, uh, the lady was in my talk and said, Bante, have you read a book called Buddha's Brain? I said, no, I don't know this book. For me, I'm just teaching from the Buddha. So I was going through different ways of dealing with difficult emotions. And the person said, no, you must have read the book by Rick Hansel. I said, no, I don't know even this author. Then she looked for the book and said, Bante, you see, this is a book. What you've been teaching is similar to what Rick Hansel has written in a, in a book, Buddha's Brain. So I started reading the book. I said, ah, wow. It's amazing. I've been talking about the things that uh, written in that book. So now, since when Rick, uh, Rick Hanson asked me to uh, to to uh, to give a talk to his group, I said, "Wow, it, it, it's going to come like full circle, you know, <laughs> full circle." <laughs> and I get to know him. Let me teach what I uh, I, I was teaching in order to get his book, <laughs> so that you can connect the dots, you know. So that's how I got to know uh, Rick Hanson. And it has been a pleasure to really over the years to uh, to communicate with him and have Zoom calls and uh, yes, uh, but I haven't met him in person. But most of the time, I meet him uh, in, 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 on, on internet uh, on cyberspace. But I'm looking forward to, to meet him next time I come to teach at uh, Spirit Rock. Uh, he told me he stays in uh, not far from the from the rock so yes i hope i hope to meet him finally and physically when i come to marine county so thank you very much okay oh there's another question another question when are, are you going to be a spirit, spirit rock uh probably not this year uh, next year they haven't invited me normally i teach the two months which is the february january february and uh Last time I taught this course was, I think, 20, actually COVID, yeah, COVID, at that time, COVID. Uh, then I think that summer I taught was 20, uh, 21. Yeah, 2021, I think I taught there. Or uh, oh, 2022, I don't remember, but I'll let you know when I come back to The Rock. I always love that place, uh, Marin mm -hmm. County. Yeah. Yes, I like California anyway. I was then in San Jose, California. So I love that part of the world. So I'll let you know. I'll let Rick also know when I come back. Okay. Oh, may I please ask someone to spell the name of the resources cited? Ah, so do you have time and I'll write them for you because somebody cannot spell them? Just a moment, let me get the book. Uh, the book is called, uh, just a moment. Ah. Let me write them in a the chat right here because I think somebody asking a very important, important question. I'm going to write them in a the chat here. Okay, Majima Nikaya, uh, two kinds of thoughts. Two kinds of thoughts. I start with number 10. Majima Nikaya 10. And Majima Nikaya number 10. Da, 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 number 10 is where. Okay, number 10. It's called the Four Foundation of Man Friends. The Four Foundation of Man Friends. Number 10 called the four foundation, the four foundations of mindfulness. Mindfulness. 
that discourse really actually is a template of the first five methods I gave you. You remember about mindfulness? That's where we can even deconstruct RAIN, R-A-I-N. We can deconstruct it and really put into perspective exactly what the Buddha was trying to say. Okay, another discourse is called Majimanika. Majimanika. Uh, Majimanika. Uh, now Majimanika is called Two Kinds of Thoughts. Hmm? Majimanika, Majimanika, 19. Uh, this is called two, two, two Thoughts, Two Kinds of Thoughts. Two kinds of thoughts, two kinds of thoughts. This helps you uh, 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 when I was talking about uh, reflection. This is about reflection, hmm? two kinds of thoughts. You can look at page, 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 uh, page uh, 2057. Hmm? When I talked about reflection, that's the discourse. Yeah, I don't see the source on the chat. Oh, someone said I don't see the sources on the chat. So, uh, Majima Nikaya is written like this, Majima Nikaya, Nikaya, like that. So that's what I call M, 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 N, Majima Nikaya. Then another Majima Nikaya I talk about is 20. 20, Majima Nikaya 20 catered for my, my uh, the five ways of dealing with difficult emotions. Uh, one is the removal, the removal, the removal the removal, the removal of destructive thoughts, destructive thoughts. Because thoughts and emotions, they feed into each other. So if, even when the Buddha is talking about removal of difficult thoughts, uh, then you can use the same method, thoughts. So this is page, uh, page, uh, page, page uh, two, one, one. So I gave 10 ways, 10 ways of dealing, 10 ways. Ten way methods or methods, 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 methods of turning, turning uh, difficult emotions, difficult emotions, difficult emotions into opportunities for awakening. Opportunities for uh, for awakening for awakening awakening. Ah, that's the topic today. Ten methods of turning, uh, turning difficult emotions into opportunities for awakening. There you go. So the speaker seems to be typing in the chat. Yes, that's what I'm doing. I'm typing in the chat. So you can now look for. Um, uh, I see everyone else's chats. So that's what uh, I think I've shared. Is that okay? You have all the resources. So if you have a physical book like this, this book is called Majima Nikaya, or you go to Access to Insight. You go to Access Insight, you can get this, all this discourse. Okay, then this is the Vitaka, Vitaka Santana Sutta, number 20, and then uh, Majima 10. Majima 10 is uh, for foundation of man. For foundations. Foundations of mindfulness. Yes. And uh, one more thing, just a moment, one more thing. One more thing that I did. I think one thing I did here. Uh, okay. Uh, Majimanika thoughts. Ah, somebody did this one, this one, copy. Uh, okay, the title of my talk was uh, 10 ways, 10 ways, 10 ways, 10 methods, 10, 10 methods, uh, 10 methods, uh, methods of turning, of turning. Uh, difficult emotion, difficult uh, emotions, emotions, emotions into uh, opportunities, into opportunities, 
opportunities for opportunities opportunity for, for opportunities is for awakening Okay. Bingo. Yeah, that was my talk today. Five was from uh, Majima Nikaya, 10. Uh, and the rest came from different discourses. Uh, there's another one even called Upali Sutta. Upali Sutta. Read the Upali Sutta. 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 Again, in Majima Nikaya, Upali. 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 So thank you very much for listening, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you again in a cyberspace or physically uh, in the United States. 